Hi again everyone. This tutorial is about ISO and gain and finding out what settings are the best to use for astrophotography. I'm going to start with a little bit of theory and then I'm going to demonstrate how you can do a simple test on your setup to find out what the best ISO and gain settings are for you. Hope you find it useful. So we'll start with the terms signal and noise. Signal is the term we use for the measure we make of the actual light. So it's the photons we're gathering, it's the stuff we want. Noise, on the other hand, is a random uh, fluctuation in the measurement generated for each pixel by the sensor itself in the camera, and we certainly don't want it. It's not related to the scene uh, that we're imaging in any way, and it makes faint features hard, if not impossible, to see in our images because they're down uh, close to where the noise uh, is. So all camera sensors generate noise, unfortunately. That's a fact of life, but uh, some do so more than others. Some sensors are better than others. Uh, and uh, noise generated by the sensor is always higher at higher temperatures, uh, so it's uh, often referred to as thermal noise. Now, just as an example, here's uh, a, a shot taken with a monochrome camera with the lens cap on, so there's no light coming in at all, no photons, and I've stretched it uh, in Photoshop so you can actually see uh, the noise, because uh, obviously it's at a very low level, it would just look black to the eye, but it is there. And uh, it's when you do that stretching of your, of your final image in the post-processing that you see this anyway. So I've stretched it so you can see it. Um, the hot pixels would always be the same if there are hot pixels on your sensor, but the noise is a randomness. So if I were to take this again and again, it's the randomness that's different every time, which is what we call the noise. Uh, so dark frames, as you may have seen for calibration, are taking out the systematic part, but the random part, dark frames don't help at all. Uh, and, uh, and that's what we're interested in here, is that, that random noise. This is the same thing from a color sensor. You'll notice it's pr pretty green, uh, and that's because of the bio matrix, uh, which on this particular sensor is two greens for every one red and one blue uh, pixel, so it's dominated by green, uh, so that's normal. Uh, now, signal-to-noise ratio is really the thing we're interested in, and uh, now that we understand signal and noise, we now need to be thinking about that ratio. We need that ratio to be as high as we can so that faint objects that would otherwise be buried in the noise are actually at a higher level than the noise. Uh, so we want a high signal-to-noise ratio. And there are different ways to maximize your signal-to-noise ratio in your imagery. And the first is to use a wider aperture, whether that's a lower F number on your camera lens or a telescope with a bigger aperture for the same focal length. Uh, if it's got a lower, lower F number, then it'll gather more light, it'll gather light faster. So uh, the other next technique is to use a longer total exposure time. So that either means uh, stacking more images of the same duration or stacking the same number of images of a longer duration. The total, uh, total time of the exposures, uh, as, it, as that goes up, your signal adds, your noise averages, so that ratio between the signal and the noise in your final image increases. Uh, you could also cool your sensor uh, get that thermal noise down, generate less noise in the first place, doesn't change the level of your signal because the noise has got smaller, that signal to noise ratio has increased. So just to, as a visual representation so you can actually see signal to noise ratio at work, this is a single 60 second shot taken apart of the Orion Nebula with a color camera and you can see noise in the background. Uh, and then uh, taken 86 more shots and stacked them with the first one uh, and this was the result. So you can see the signal level is about the same in these two images, but the noise level is dramatically reduced. And in the background, we see a much smoother uh, 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 background. And there are also faint features, such as this area here and up here, where there are details we can now see, which you couldn't see at all with a single shot. So that's a really nice example of signal-to-noise ratio at work. The next consideration is dynamic range. Completely different to signal to noise ratio, dynamic range is about the range of brightness values that your uh, setup can record. And why is this important? Well, in a typical scene, and here's the Whirlpool Galaxy as an example, there are bright features and faint features. And we want to be able to see the detail ideally in both. We want to see that our stars are nice and bright and sharp. We want to be able to see the detail in the bright core of this galaxy. Um, and, uh, but we also want to be able to see those really faint dust lanes in the outer reaches uh, of this, uh, this galaxy. So, so we want to be able to see detail in both the bright and the faint 
and that needs a high dynamic range. If we have a low dynamic range and we use a long exposure, then those bright objects will saturate or clip, uh, sometimes known as uh, being blown out, the stars are blown out, and in fact, in this example, the stars are a bit blown out and the core of the galaxy is a bit blown out. It's just basically a, a, a disk, they look like disks instead of points. I can't see the real detail in the, in the core of uh, the Whirlpool galaxy here because it has blown out. Uh, so it's a dynamic range issue with this shot, so it's a good example. If your dynamic range is too low and you shorten the exposure, well that will prevent uh, having a blown out signal in the bright areas of the image, but those fainter features, they'll, they'll be weaker and they'll be going down towards the noise and be harder to see above the noise level. So dynamic range very important. Here's another good example, uh, the main part of the Great Orion Nebula, and there's this particularly bright area here, where in this example, uh, it's really hard to see the detail. It's, being, it's starting to blow out up here, and we're just really struggling to see what's going on in this area. But there are really faint nebulosity and dust areas around the edges of, of Orion, uh, where you really need um, lots of exposure time and uh, to be able to see them at all and get them up above the noise. But when you do that, you often find that this bright area will blow out. And so it's a particularly difficult target to image. And actually, the, the technique that most people would use to resolve that would be to, to actually have two separate stacks of data, one with a shorter exposure time in order to get the detail on the bright areas, and another with a, a long exposure time to get the faint stuff, and then blend them together somehow in Photoshop. So that's a very challenging target from the point of view of dynamic range. So for good astrophotography images, we need a high signal-to-noise ratio and a high dynamic range. So now to ISO and gain, which is what this tutorial was really all about. What are ISO and gain settings all about? Well, they control the amount of amplification in your sensor. That's a simplistic uh, uh, overview because, in fact, all sensors are designed differently and the detail of what's going on on the actual sensor itself are very complicated. But uh, ISO and gain are used in all photography in conjunction with the exposure time and the aperture to achieve what we would call a good exposure. So their purpose is to adjust the signal level in the sensor output so that we see the thing we're trying to take a photograph of at a nice level. So why don't we just use the maximum ISO or gain setting on our camera? Well, uh, firstly, adjusting the ISO or gain may change the noise level as well as the signal. But all sensors are different. They include different amplifier stages, and some, some of them switch those stages on and off depending on the ISOs that you select. So it's not obvious what setting uh, to use for ISO and gain to give the best signal-to-noise ratio. Not obvious at all, and it depends very much on what uh, sensor you have. Uh, but it is fair to say that a higher ISO or gain setting will almost always result in a reduced dynamic range. So we've got this conundrum. We've got a high ISO gives us more signal, great but it gives us less dynamic range, not great. So how do we know the best ISO I'm going to use? And what about signal to noise ratio as well? So it's complicated, it is complicated. Um, so how do we get around that? Well, thankfully, there's a fairly easy test that we can do ourselves, which I'm gonna demonstrate in this video, to help us figure out what's the best ISO and gain setting to use on our particular camera. Um, and uh, you can do this test yourself and find out and, and go, then when you're going out to take your pictures, you'll know you're using the optimum ISO game. And before I dive into the demonstration video, just to say there's a couple of useful references. The first is that if you're using DSLRs, uh, there's this excellent website, Photons to Photos, which is uh, bringing together of data from many people's cameras around the world. And there are graphs on there that you can look at and see how the dynamic range varies with ISO on your particular camera. Uh, and also how other things like uh, shadow noise reduction and other various effects uh, uh, go on. It's quite a complex and technical website, uh, but you may find it useful to take a look. But uh, there's a, an excellent article which actually led me to making this tutorial uh, on all about ISO on Petapixel. If you follow the link here, it's well worth a read. It's not too long. It's very easy to understand. And uh, this is actually where the test I'm going to do and demonstrate now came from and I think it's a really effective test and hopefully you'll agree with that. So I hope you find it helpful and hope you follow.
and that this gives you the answer you've wanted of what ISO and what game you should use. So let's get into it. So we'll start with the lights on nice and brightly. I'll we'll switch the camera on and put it into live view. Okay, so I'm going to switch the lens image stabilizer off and put it into automatic focus and uh, then choose the subject and focus it. Then switch the lens to manual focus. Now I'm going to go to manual mode on the camera. I'm going to set the ISO to 3200. And the aperture wide open, which in this case is f4. I'm going to go into the menus. So first I'm going to turn off the long exposure noise reduction. And then I'm going to turn off the high ISO speed noise reduction. And then I'm going to go to the image quality and select raw with no JPEG. And then come out of the menus. And uh, now I'm going to half depress the shutter so I can use the exposure meter at the bottom and adjust the exposure time. Uh, first I need to drop the lights though, so we'll just dim the lighting now. So with the lights dimmed, now I'm going to half press the shutter and Increase the exposure time until I get a good exposure here. So you see that a one second exposure at this ISO 3200 looks sufficient. So we'll now take that shot. And there's our shot. So now I'm going to just change ISO and nothing else. So I'm going to drop right down to 100 ISO. Select that and take the shot again. And I'm being careful not to move around the room. I don't want to change any shadows. I don't want the lighting conditions to change at all. I just want to change the ISO and then retake the shot. So I'm doubling the ISO each time. So this time is ISO 200 and take the shot. And then I'll select ISO 400 and take the shot. And then choose ISO 800 and take the shot. And now 1600, take the shot. I will redo 3200, although I've obviously already taken that one. I'll just do it as part of my sequence so I'm confident the lighting conditions are exactly the same. And now Double again to 6400. And then the final setting on my camera at least of 12800. You can keep going until you get to the highest ISO your camera can do. Okay, so that's my data. I'm now going to switch the camera off and take that data up to the PC. Okay, I've copied those eight images onto my PC and I've opened up Lightroom and I've imported them. So I'm now going to go to the develop tab and I'm going to take one picture at a time and I'm going to adjust the exposure so that all of them match the exposure for the ISO 3200 shot. So I won't make an adjustment to that one. So we start with the ISO 100 image which is pretty dark and uh, we'll just select that image and go to exposure and rather than using the slider I'm just going to go uh, to the number at the side, double click it and enter 5 and hit return. That's now lifted the ISO 100 exposure by five stops. I'll now go to the ISO 200. And I'll do the same thing except I'll lift that by four stops. I'll go to the ISO 400 and I'll lift that by three stops. The ISO 800 I'll lift by two stops. The ISO 1600 I'll lift by one stop, 3200 will leave alone, the 6400 I'm going to put minus one, so I'm going to go down one stop, and then the 12800 I'm going to go down two stops, so minus two.
we now go through those images, this is 12800, 6400, 3200, 1600, 800, 400, 200, and 100. So it's pretty convincing that the signal level in all eight images are now identical. So what we're going to do now that we've matched the signal level in all eight images is to uh, zoom in on one area. So I'm going to zoom in on this area just here. And I'm going to uh, switch between the different images and compare the noise level. We know the signal's the same, but what's the noise doing? Of course, where the noise is lowest is where we've got the best signal-to-noise ratio because the signal levels are all matched. So I'm actually going to take a uh, screenshot of, of each of the images in the same uh, portion and I'm going to put them in PowerPoint so that I can flick easily between them. I'll be back in a second. Okay, by the magic of YouTube, that's done. And uh, now I've got eight PowerPoint slides, each one with the same segment of image for each ISO. And I've labeled each one at the top, so there's no confusion about which one is which. So we'll start with the ISO 100, and we compare that with the ISO 200. And it's very easy to see that the 200 has a much lower noise level than the ISO 100. Now we can go from 200 to 400, and you can still see that there is an, Im an improvement. It's not as big a, a step as it was from 100 to 200, but definitely the noise has dropped. So now we'll go to 800, and even with 400 to 800, I would say there is a slight improvement in the noise. It's not huge anymore. And then from 800 to 1600, I'm really struggling to see any difference at all in the noise and then 1600 to 3200, there's no change. 3200 to 6400, there's no change. And 6400 to 12800, there's no change. So what this means is that I get, for the same signal level, remember we're going to stretch our astrophotography images to see the signal, and when we do so, we want the noise to be as low as possible. So if I take ISO 800 or 1600 or 3200 or 6400 or 12800 and I take my astrophotography images with any of those and I stretch them my noise is going to look the same and so because of the dynamic range issue I want to use the lowest dynamic range that is going to uh, the, the lowest ISO which gives me the widest dynamic range without paying a penalty in signal to noise and that is ISO 800 for my sensor which is the Canon EOS 5DS yours may well be different. Uh, I do not want to go below ISO 800 because then I'm seeing a definite degradation in the noise. So with that simple test, I now know that for astrophotography with this camera, ISO 800 is the right ISO to use. Now I'm aware that the YouTube video compression might make it difficult to see these noise levels due to compression artifacts. So I've prepared this mosaic, which is a static image, and hopefully that will be easier for you to see the changes in noise levels between the different ISO settings. I hope you do the same thing on your sensor. If you like this, please subscribe to my channel. It helps grow the channel and encourages me to make more videos. I really appreciate it. It also means you get to see when I've released another tutorial as well. Thanks very much for watching. See you next time.